Okay. So first thing, if you haven't done this already, create a new Unity project. Call it whatever. Uh, default 3D. I mean, if you do 2D, again, that only changes the camera setting. So you can do 2D if you really want to. So wait till this opens. Anytime. I help anytime. Okay. So. Just going to set that. So last week we went over physics. And if you did not do that, that's fine. This week I figured we would use some of the things we did last week to make a simple 3D platformer. Pretty simple. Not No big animations like Ryan had. No nice sound effects. This is all just... Yeah, <laughs> we're using just basically just the physics. So first thing we're going to want to do is make the player. I'm going to make a cube for the player because I'm unoriginal and garbage. So, I mean, you should probably make a cube as well, by the way, because, yeah. Okay, so, and then I'm also going to make a platform for the player to start on. So I'm going to make it pretty big and a little bit thinner. I'm going to put the player smack dab on top of it. OK. So I'm also going to call this platform. So one of the first things that you have to worry about when you're making a game, especially a platformer, is movement. So what we can do is we can make a script. We can call it player movement and open that up. Hopefully Visual Studio does not open on. Okay. Thank God. Okay. So because this is physics based, we're going to be using rigid bodies for a lot of this stuff. So we can do, we did this in Ryan's 2D platformer and a bit last week. We can make a private rigid body, RB. Good point. And then we can say RB equals get component, weird caret thing, rigid body. Does that have a name? I call it angle bracket. That might be actually what it's called. Yeah. Use angle brackets. Yeah. Um, so do this just for getting it started. And then we're also going to need some other variables for things. So one of the things we might want is the movement speed. And we can make that private. But if we make that private, we would have to enter the code and change it every time we wanted to experiment with it. So it would be a little bit better to make it public. So you can make a public float for speed, and then a public float for jumping speed. That way we can determine from in the editor how fast we're moving and how fast we want to jump, how much force we want to add to it. So and then this was also from last week. Instead of update, because we're doing physics, and we're doing physics per frame, we should be using fixed update. Because physics, and physics doesn't like update. So now what we can do is we can make it, we can add the actual movement back and forth. This is pretty simple. We can take RB, add a force, and then we can make a new vector three because we want to put in what we're moving it by. And we can take input.getAxis and horizontal. So this would be dub A and D. This would be left arrow, right arrow. Then zero float because we don't want to be moving up at all when we're moving side to side and up and down. And then the same thing, 
except for vertical. And that, and then we can multiply that by our speed. So this makes it so that we take, so, so input.getAxis gets a value from negative one to one based on which direction you're pushing. And by multiplying it by speed, that means our maximum force that we would be adding would be um, one times our speed value, which is exactly what we want. And then we can also multiply this by time dot delta time, which is the time since the last frame, which basically makes it so instead of adding 50 force per frame, we would be adding 50 force per second, which is a lot easier to deal with and a lot easier to understand. And then the final thing is let's make this force mode velocity change I had because I want it to be fairly responsive and quick because in a platformer controls are one of the most important things and if you can't move very fast and you slip off of something and die you're not going to feel like you didn't do it you're going to feel like the developer screwed you over which is not a good feeling so after you have that does anybody still need to see this? You guys good? One quick thing about the axes. Uh, for horizontal and vertical, because you're doing this on a keyboard, it'll most always likely be 0, 1. There might be a frame where it's like 0. 0.5 or something. Mm -hmm. So it's usually going to be top speed or no speed. But if you use something like a joystick, yeah. um, if you depend on how far you tilt the joystick, we'll move between 0 and 1. I think actually on a keyboard when you're using get axis, it like moves sort of gradually towards up, one. Pretty, pretty so it's, yeah, it is pretty it is pretty quick. If you use get access raw, it will only return zero and one. So that's if you want something to be really snappy. For instance, if you're making a top down 2D game, you probably wouldn't want the controls to be real smooth. You wouldn't want to be sliding around on ice. You'd want to be moving very crisply. If that makes yeah. Okay. That's I'm sure it is. So, after that, now we're going to want to make jumping. So, if we were to actually do this, we can add it to the player now, that's fine. So, we can take Mr. Player, we can add on your scripts, player movement, or you can just drag it in from here. And so, we can give this speed of 10. So, now... Oopsies. We also need to add a rigid body. That was the other thing. So we don't want to forget that. So rigid body. And then I'm actually going to put the drag to one. Because one of the things is in a platformer, you don't want the player to really be going really fast. Because they'll skip a lot of the level if they just jump over half of it. So by giving it a lot of drag, that sort of forces it to reach a max speed quicker. So, now, you can see we can move it, but it rolls around. Now, you might want rolling around in your game, but here we probably don't because it gets really hard to tell when you should be jumping and whatnot because you're constantly getting off the ground and not touching the ground and it makes movement kind of janky. So what we can do in is in rigid body, we can go to constraints and we can freeze the rotation for all axes. So this way it will only it won't rotate at all. Now the other problem is is there's a lot of friction going on, and we don't want tons of friction because if we are trying to move at the same speed on the ground and in the air and we have a ton of friction we won't we'll move much slower on the ground so what we can do is we did this we briefly touched on this in the 2d platformer we can go to create in the assets and we can make a physics material and we can call this no friction and we can turn the frictions 
to zero. And this was sort of where the drag came in. The other purpose of the drag is because we're not really using any friction, the drag makes it so that we still reach a max speed so we don't just jettison off at infinity. So then we can take this and here in box collider we can set the physics material to no friction for both the platform and the player. And so now we can pretty easily move around. Yippee, we did it. <laughs> the player can move. Ship it up. That's always important. Are you guys caught up? What's up with it? I went a little bit faster. What? I don't know why I was doing that. I don't know why I was doing that. Um, uh, I do know this, that your lighting might be a little bit off. So if you go to window, and then you go to lighting near the bottom, then you say near the bottom, it says auto. If you uncheck auto and you hit build, Oh, and you got to save the scene, yeah, okay. I'll just say this is level one. If you build it, does that do anything? Because I've actually found that auto sometimes does some pretty weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the lighting was off. By a bit. Do you have a directional light in your scene? But some, sometimes the default has it. Depends on your version. So now another thing is, um, right now our player, our camera does not move with our player. So if we move and we fall off, we have no idea where we are. We're just somewhere in the void. Just don't fall off. Yeah, right? So one of the pretty simple ways to do this, this might not be the best depending on your game, is we can attach the camera to the player. We can put it underneath so that the player is the parent. What this does is it means that anything, that any change in position that the player has is a change in position for the camera as well. So it follows it at the same distance and does everything the same. The reason that this might not always work is if we unfreeze our rotation again and we keep it attached just as it is, if we fall off of something, the camera flips with it and it yeah. is very, very disorienting. Dude. And because our movement is just based on world space, it wouldn't... Forward would not keep meaning forwards if it rotated. It would start to mean left if you turned right, and it would be a, it would be a disaster. So it's usually a pretty good idea if your player isn't going to be spinning and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. It's usually pretty easy to just put the camera on there. So... And then I'm also actually going to raise the camera a little bit so that I get a better angle on seeing what's ahead. So now we've got movement, or we should have movement. So now we can do jumping. So if you go back to your script, we can add an if statement. We can say if input dot get key down, and then we can say key code dot space so what that does is it's saying if a key is being pressed down and that key is space do whatever it is in this if statement you can also use get key which just returns true for every frame that that key is being pressed you can also get get key up for when you let go of that key so there are three events there's getting down then there's continuous and then there's getting up Jumping, we really only want 
the single press. We only want it when it's down. We wouldn't really want it every frame because then we'd shoot off into this guy. So we can say this. If they press that, then we can do another add force, except this time in the direction of the Y. So we can do that. Yeah. Actually, do you need to do that? I didn't have that in my thing and it worked. That is weird. Okay, yeah, new vector three, yeah, okay. So we don't need anything in the X. For the Y, we can just do our jump speed and nothing in the Z. And then we can say force mode dot impulse. So impulse is, it uses its mass to determine how high you jump, because if the player has anything on top of them or is in an area where their mass is increased, you'd want it so they couldn't jump as high. That just, that makes sense. Whereas moving, you wouldn't really care about because you wouldn't really want the player to be moving super slowly if they're being weighed down necessarily. So if we do this, just as is, we can jump. No, we can't. <laughs> we, need to, we need to give it some force behind it. So jump speed, let's put it 10. That's right. So now we can jump. Now the problem is we can jump forever. And that's not really a good thing. You want it to be able to jump just once after touching the ground. So we can, there's a lot of ways to do this. We can use triggers, we can use colliders, like collisions. Um, for this, I'm going to use a trigger because I'm lazy and I don't want to deal with colliders. I did that earlier and it didn't really work all that well. So what you can do is you can add another component. You can add a box collider. Now we've already got a box collider up here, but that's not a trigger. So we pick a box collider and we make it a trigger and then we can make the size on the Y a bit bigger, say 1.2. So now, if we move this up, we can see the okay. We can see that it has a outline on it. So this outline up here is the trigger box. So then we can go into the code and we can make a another variable that is a bool bool for those who aren't code those for those who don't know code that well bool is just true or false something that holds either a zero or one so we can make a bool called grounded and we can set grounded to be initially false so when grounded is true, you're grounded, and that means you should be able to jump. So then we can add here, for the space, we can add an and, and we can say and grounded is equal to true. So that way, if we're not grounded, we won't be able to jump. Now, we actually need to set grounded to true. We need to make it so that it works out. So what we can do is, we can use on trigger enter, on trigger exit, and on trigger stay. So, or those are the three, we're only gonna use two of those. So we can do void on trigger enter, just like that, with that capitalization, that's already determined in Unity, and that makes it so that any time a, your object either enters another trigger or their trigger enters something else, this is called. So we can say on trigger enter, Collider other. So collider stores the object that you just touched. It stores its collider. So we can say if other dot transform dot position dot y is less than or equal to transform dot position dot y. 
So what that means is all I'm checking for is I'm checking if the other object is lower than my object. Because if the trigger hits from the top or from the side somehow, we don't want it to be able to, so that you can jump off of a ceiling or a wall. We want to make sure that just the object is beneath us. This is just one of the ways to do it. There's a lot of ways to check if we are touching something. So, and then here we can just set grounded equal to true. So when we are, when we are touching an object beneath us with the trigger, we can, it makes it so that we are able to jump, which means once you jump, you lose that ability to jump because you'll no longer be touching something beneath you. And then the other thing we need to make sure obviously that we're not touching something so we can do void on trigger exit collider other and here grounded is equal to false we can add the if it's beneath us again but that shouldn't really matter because there's no situation where we would be leaving something where we wouldn't where we would be able to jump so if we save that and go back into our scene, we press play. You might not be able to hear it, but I'm pressing space as fast as I can. You can only jump once. Yeah. That's right. You can hear clicks, can't you? Yeah. Sorry about that then. Sorry about that. Now you have to edit that. Now I have to clean it up. Ha <laughs> ha. Sorry. Um, so we got jumping down. So oh, we got jumping up. Oh. Here's Shut up, Ryan. Shut up. You don't jump down, you jump up. So as Bubsy would say, what's a good platformer without any platforms? We can duplicate this and move it forwards with a gap. So now the player goes forwards and can jump across things. Yippee. Now, there's one other thing. If we fall right now, we just fall and we can't get back. So what we can do is we can go back to our code for player movement and we can add something up at using. We can say using unity engine dot scene man management because load at load level was apparently too easy to use and they had to make it more complicated unity decided to make it stupid so we need to add scene management up here and then in our update we need to add if our position What's up? I'm just checking my code. If transform.position.y is less than or equal to, oh, this is off screen, it's less than or equal to negative five, because that should be below any point where we would be doing things, then we can add this totally, totally way too long of a name. We can add scene manager dot load scene so now this loads whatever the string of the scene name is and we can hard code it to say level one but the problem is is if we say level one and we make multiple levels and keep using the script it would continuously load you back to level one if you died so we can say scene manager yeah I know scene manager inside the scene manager line get active scene which gets whatever scene is currently in use. Don't forget the parentheses after that. And then dot name. And that will give us the current scene that's being used, so level one, in string format. So now, if you go to the game, and if you fall off the edge, because you're terrible, like you forget to jump, oops, once it's done, once you get below or at negative five, 
it reloads the level and resets everything. You could set the position back to the beginning, but if you have objects that will only do something once, so for instance, if you have a gun that shoots at you once you walk by it, and it only shoots once, you would want to reload the whole scene so that you get all that back, rather than just putting your position back to zero. Because a lot of people, when they make it at first, just set the position because whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you're collecting coins and you get five and then you die, you should probably reset those because you're restarting the level. So, I believe that's it for player at the moment. Now, there's one other thing. Um, you can't really see very well with this. This is really just white on white, which is, you shouldn't do white on white. That's a bad idea. So what we can do is, we can create materials. So if you go to your assets, and you go create, you should see material right near the middle. So you can create a material, and you can call it, let's call this player. So what color do you guys think player should be? Purple? All right, purple. So we can set this value to purple. I'm colorblind. You guys are going to have to tell, help me. Purple? More purple? That's good? OK, cool. <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> You're going to actually confuse me. So then you can take the player and add our mesh renderer. No, not our mesh renderer. Yes, our mesh renderer. Where is it? Wait, Jacob. Where the hell is it? Use the colorblind mode in games. Yeah, yeah, I do. How useful is it? Pretty useful. Pretty darn useful a lot of the time, actually. Hey, Ryan. Where do you add materials to things? I thought it was mesh renderer. It is. It's, you have to go, it's in materials. It's in materials. Drop down. Drop down. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Okay. You can also just drag on the material. On yeah. The yeah. Well, that's true, and that is more fun. Because you can see it change things as you're dragging. Ooh. The so we can make the player purple, yeah. and but then yeah, we can, you can add. See, you can see the mesh renderer did also update. Yeah. 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 I forgot it was under the drop down, and I was confused for a second. Thank you. you can't have multiple Oh yeah. So let's create another and call it platform. What color should the platform yellow. be? Yellow? Yellow. Yellow. Yellow it is. Yellow. Has to be yellow. No, I think it's the light. Yeah, it's the light, the light turns off in your eyes. Yeah, that looks great. And then the final thing we can do is we can keep this default background or Piece. Or we can either change it to a different skybox if we have other skyboxes, or we can also, if we get a camera here, we can say solid color. And I'm going to go ahead and say it should green. probably Lime not green. be gr Lime Lime green. No. Oh, no. <laughs> that does not make me. So no. Let's do. Let's just, let's just put it at black. So it's just no very neon. It's not neon enough. It could be more neon with green. Yellow with yellow. How's that, Ryan? <laughs> you know what the only problem with this is? The only problem with this is that our player isn't yellow as well. Now it's perfect. Aww. No, make the background the same yellow as the platforms. So you can't see. The so you can't see. You then just make the platforms invisible. Yeah, no, you just use the shading of the platforms. Yeah. They are happy. Now it's invisible. Now we got an invisible platform. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put black because I think that's pretty easy to see. So now you can tell it is a lot easier to tell where you are and what you're doing because you can actually tell the difference between the player and the platforms, which is usually a good idea in your game. Why is my platform jumping? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Unless you want some weird gimmick where your platforms jump. Your platform jumps on players instead. <laughs> <laughs> you have to control the platforms, not the player. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So, we have... That. So now, what we should probably add in our level is an exit, something going to another level. 
So we can make a cube again because I'm awful and lame. And we can make it pretty big. So let's give that eight, uh, five. Make this four, zero point five. 0.2 okay and we can make this sort of the doorway to the next level because it's always good to have a goal something to look at and go forward to so what we can do is we can make a new script and call it exit and then open it up So we want something that will dynamically be able to change what scene you're in. Meaning we don't just want it to go to level two because in level two, you wouldn't want to go to level two. You'd be wanting to go to level three. So what we can do is we can add a public string and call it level name. We're also going to need to add our handy dandy unity engine dot scene manager because application dot load level was too darn easy apparently I'm still salty about that there used to be a way where you could just say application dot load level and it would just do it and that was it, it just but now you can't so we can actually get rid of start and update just poof gone we can add a void on trigger enter Meaning, whenever an object enters this trigger, we can say if other dot game object dot name dot equal dot equals player. You can also do it by tag if you want to. If you want to name have the object name have no say in it if you can do tag but I'm gonna I'm gonna do name here so we don't have to set the tag and then I can say scene manager this line is gonna be a little bit less awful right load scene level name and that's it this way once the player enters that trigger it loads whatever is set in there so we want to take our exit and we want to add the exit script and because this level is called level one I'm going to put in level one for now normally you would put in level two or level three or ice world or whatever you want to call it casino land I don't know and but here I'm just going to have it reset the level because I'm not super worried about getting all, all sorts of levels working right now. I'm just trying to get it to work and show that it does work. It might not work. should work. It might not. It does. Okay. I, know the, I know the reason you thought it wasn't, okay. which I was about yeah, to mention. That's fair. Um, <laughs> if you're making, if you're getting your stuff to go from level to level, you need to go to File, and your Build Settings, which appeared on the other screen. And you need to add your scene that you're in right now to the build settings. This way, basically, it just adds it to the lineup of scenes that will be included in the game. If it's not in there, even if you're doing it from inside the editor, it still won't switch to the next level because it hasn't yet recognized that this is part of a continuous thing. So, uh, let's make... I'm going to make a final color final material. What should exit be? Teal. teal? Is, that, green. is that teal? Uh, actually, that works too. Yeah, it works. Okay. Also, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is oh, this is not going to be a pretty game. This is going to be... Ooh, ooh, it looks... Ooh, boy. Uh, I would still buy it. Two platforms. <laughs> You'd still buy... <laughs> two platforms? Yeah. Your mom let you have two platforms? So... Now, our game is pretty simple right now. All you're doing is jumping. That's it. So I want to spice it up and say I want to make a low gravity zone. 
an area that when you're in it, gravity is less effective. So it lets the player jump higher, jump further, fall slower, you know, gravity things. So what we can do is we can start by making yet another tube. Wow, we, that's, that's something. And we can make this one. <laughs> we can make this one pretty big. And we can make this the zone that you have low gravity on you. Now, we should probably make it so that, yeah, I know, another material. This is looking pretty repetitive. But we can make it so that this won't interrupt our view, but we still want to be able to see it. So one of the things we can do is, instead of doing opaque, we can do fade. We can make it, I'm going to make it red. Too bad. And then I'm actually going to turn this, the alpha, down. And as you can see on the bottom right, it makes that circle so you can see it less. It makes it more transparent. So then if you drag that onto here, you can see it now becomes a clear see-through square or cube. It also makes that a different color. I can't tell what color that is. Is that just gray? Or is that the same color? Shut up. I hate you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, right now, our thing, let's call this low grav zone. And we're going to want to make it a trigger. That way, the player doesn't walk on it because that makes no sense. So, we can make another script. We can make a script called low grav which makes which will make the player whenever they're in it have less gravity so here we've opened it up so first of all since we're going to be affecting the player and the player's rigid body we should do what we've done a few times now and we should make a rigid body called rb and set that not equal to just get component. This time, we can do game object dot find player, which finds a game object with the name player. Then dot get component. Then the angle brackets. I think they were called rigid body parentheses. So that will find whatever player or whatever object is in the hierarchy named player, and then it gets the rigid body component out of it. So the other thing we're going to want to do is we're probably going to need a bool to keep track of is the player inside of this area or not. Um, there's other ways to do it, but this is what I'm going to do. So, and I'm going to say affected. So if they're being affected, true. If not, false. And then I'm going to default that to false. So, the last thing is I'm going to want to make this fixed update because, again, dealing with physics, dealing with physics every frame, you want to do that. So there's a few ways to do this. So... I can say if affected is equal to true, or just if affected should work. So what I can, I can do, there's multiple ways of doing this. For instance, if I ignore that for a second, and I do an on trigger enter, one of the things that I could do is I could say physics dot gravity equals new vector three. D don't write that. You don't need to write this down, by the way. Negative two zero f. Now, if you guys remember from any physics physics classes you've taken, gravity is negative nine point eight normally. So here I'm just setting it to negative two, which is considerably less. But 
the problem with doing this is this sets the entire physics engine's gravity to that value, which means if you have any other physics objects in your game, those are also going to have low gravity. If you just want to affect the player, this is not the best way of doing it, unless you don't have any other physics objects, in which case it doesn't really matter. So instead of using this, we're going to comment that out. If you didn't write it, that's perfectly fine. And we're going to say, first of all, if other dot game object dot tag dot equals no, not tag my bad dot name dot equals player meaning we're just making sure that the player is the one actually entering this we can set affected is equal to true so instead of changing the physics what we can do is we can simply add a force to counteract what we have. So we can do a new vector and we can add, instead of changing the gravity to be less, we can add a counteracting force constantly. And then we'll make that a force mode of acceleration. The reason we want to do acceleration is because we want it to have the same effect regardless of weight regardless of mass because it needs to be reducing the amount of gravity the same. So the reason I picked 7.8 is because originally I was changing it to negative 2 and the difference between 9.8 and negative 2 is, you guessed it, 7.8. Oh my god, what? I know, right? So what this does is every frame the normal effect of gravity is it constantly gives it negative 9.8. So by at the same time adding 7.8, those two basically cancel out to negative 2 instead. So it's, the, it's basically the same effect, but this is only going to affect the player rather than every object. If you wanted to affect every object, by all means change the physics, but if you don't, you don't, you don't want to do that. So, we're also going to add an on trigger exit so that gravity is not permanently affected. We want to turn it back. And so we can just say if, in fact, I'm just going to copy this because that's easier. Spoiler if you want to make games, get good at copying and pasting, it's pretty helpful. And make affected false instead. What? Eh, it's not always a good thing. <laughs> not just copying and pasting, but copying and pasting it and then changing the second... whatever. Yeah. Go back to your entry script. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, let's see if this will work. Let's cross our fingers and hope that Writing this whole bit will work. So if I take this and I add our new script, our player jumps that high normally. But once they go into the zero gravity or the low gravity zone, you can see that they jump considerably higher and they stay in the air for much longer. And once we leave it, it goes back to normal. So, what we can do is, we can give the player an isolated example. This is just game design in general. We can make this much smaller and move it here to the side. And we can raise this. The reason I'm doing this is, this way the player can see, oh, I can't get up there. What is this? Then they jump, and then they almost can. Right? All right, fair enough. Whatever. It was close. It was, I was eyeballing it. So there, now they can see, okay, this reduces gravity, which means that if you give them a very long 
bit with the huge jump, they know I can make this because I've seen it. So, you know, basic game design 101. Give them, give them an isolated example so that they can figure out how it works. So, the, uh, for the material, you need to make it fade instead of opaque. And then in the color, it's the alpha channel. Alpha refers to transparency. If you don't have it as fade, though, it changes. For instance, transparent won't actually make it so that you can... It, all it does is it just makes it less there, whereas fade lets you see through it more. If that makes... I know that doesn't make any sense. Same sort of. I don't know how to explain it. Go back to transparent. Don't do cut out. basically the same thing, but... Um, I think fade reduces the lighting on it as well. I think so, but transparency is because there's multiple faces going into a thing. I think it adds them, but I think, mm. I think fade just keeps it all consistently. Yeah. So like if you look through like a top or a corner, like depending on how many like sides you look through, it'll change. I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe I have no know. idea. I use fade because I think it looks nicer. Sure. It's got less lighting on it. That is not for reason, then. Yeah. So now we've got. Get rid of shadows. What? Shadows on that would be it. Receive shadows. Yeah. Or no, cast shadows. Off. See? There you go. Yep. That, that looks nice. Making you happy, Ryan. Yeah. That looks nice. <laughs> so now we've got some really basic game mechanics. We've got jumping, platform to platform. We've got an exit. We've got a low gravity zone. Now, I'm going to introduce something that a lot of people have trouble with when they make games, especially in Unity, and that's moving platforms. The reason people have trouble with that is a lot of the time when they make a moving platform, you don't move with it. You sort of get left behind, especially if we're using the same no friction mater physics materials. The platform will move, and the player will just fall right off, and they won't be able to keep up. So we're going to make a moving platform that will actually keep you on it. Hopefully. Hopefully this will work. It should, but you never know with programming. So I'm going to move that back, and I'm going to make another platform right here. I'm going to call it moving platform. And actually, before I go any further, I forgot to mention this. Um, right now, one of the problems we have is you can actually jump inside. No, you can. Oh, yeah, it already broke it. Cool. The problem is uh, that I forgot to mention, if you jump, if you try to jump inside of this area, it is technically calling the on trigger enter for the player. And it can screw some stuff up. So real quick change to the code. Forgot to mention this earlier, my bad. If we go back to the player movement, we can add an and other dot, it? It up. other dot name dot contains low grav and then we can invert that just so that if the object that we are entering is the no gravity zone it won't completely screw everything up because we're using multiple triggers so we need to differentiate between them and then we also want to add it here so if other dot name.contains we want to put our grounded statement in there um yeah it as i mean if you just don't jump while you're in it you're fine so you don't need to change this but if you want it to be consistent you'd want to change that so sorry you guys are probably still looking at that I'll give you a chance to even if you don't jump in it there's a player out there that will mm -hmm. you should test with other people you've discovered that Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, fix that. Absolutely. Yep. 
You could also, instead of saying the name doesn't contain low gravity, you could also say, for instance, it contains platform. But if you have other objects that you want to jump off of and you don't want to name everything you can jump off of platform, that's a little bit easier. So, you guys good on that? Ish? Okay. Just making sure you're caught up at least a little bit. So, our moving platform, we're going to want to add a script to that. We can call that moving platform. And open it up. So, moving platform has, we can do some interesting programming things to it where we can give it a stage system where it's at stage one when it's moving one way and once it reaches its destination it goes to stage two moves back and once it gets there it goes back to stage one so we can implement a pretty simple system to go back and forth like that so what we can do is we can add a public first things first vector three and call it position one because we want to have a set we want this to be able to set from the editor so if we're making multiple platforms we can do it from there and that will make it so that we can set what the first position that it will start at is and then we can set a second one good lord vector three position two wow didn't expect that that's the second position that we're going to check for. So it will move between the first position and the second position, and we can change that from within the editor rather than the code by making it public. The other thing we're going to want is a public float step. So what this will do is this is the amount that it moves per frame. This way we can... well. Actually, it would be the amount we move per second because we'll multiply it by time that delta time. So, this is. So that yeah, this will just be the distance it moves. So this will basically just be setting the speed. So then, then we can say, then finally we can create an integer for stage for which stage it's at to tell if it's moving from position one to position two, or from two to one. So at the start, we should be setting stage to 0. I'm going to go from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 because programming. I'm not going to go from 1 to 2, 2 to 1. It doesn't really matter at all. So we can say switch our stage. And then we can do case 0. Go to break case one. Go to break. So if you've done any programming with switch statements and cases, then all this is is it's saying if it's zero, do after case zero. If it's one, do after case one. It's pretty basic programming. Um and so we can add nice little function so we can add transform dot position and what we could do is we could make a new vector and add the position that we want it to step by each frame or we can do some of the unity built-in stuff which I'm gonna do so we can say vector 3 dot move towards so this will move it this basically just is shorthand for creating a new vector and adding it so that it moves the set amount per frame. This is just doing it all in one step, a lot easier. So we can do from our current position, transform.position, we can set it to position two. And the distance that we move should be step times time dot delta time. So basically we're just saying move from my current position to 
towards position two by the step that we give it. Pretty simple. We can copy this line almost exactly for the other situation, except it would be moving towards position one. That's the only difference. So right now it will move towards position two and then it'll stop. So what we want to do is we want to give it a situation where it moves from stage to stage. So we can say if vector three dot distance from transform dot position to position two is less than 0 0.2 and I'll explain this in a moment. So basically this is shorthand for taking one vector and subtracting the other, which spoilers how you find distance between things. This is basically just getting the distance and what I'm doing is I'm giving it a little bit of leeway because if I say if the transform position is equal to position two, it's moving by a certain amount per frame and if it moves past that exact amount, it will keep on, it will actually, it'll just stop moving and it won't update the stage. So I want to give it a little bit of leeway. That way it will work with me and it won't kill itself. So, <laughs> those three are horrible. Yeah, that one might not. So then here we can just make stage equal to one. So this would then switch it over to the next one. Here we can copy this. I didn't mean to right click, but okay. And then we can just make it, we can set this to position one instead of two and set the stage to zero. So right now, this is basic moving platform. This does not include the player sliding off of it right now. So actually, I'll keep this open for a little bit longer. So what we can do with that is we can update the player's position with the same amount as the platform. So first I want to demonstrate that it actually does move. Are you good? Okay. So first I want to demonstrate that it does move. So we can add our moving platform script to said moving platform. We can set position one to its current position. Just copy over the values. And then say we want it to move in the X direction. We can move it to where we want it to go and copy that into position two. So and then give it a step of five, say, so it moves five per second. So now it will move from position one, which we've set to position two somewhere over there and it'll move by five position per second. So as we can see, it does move. Hooray, that's amazing. And it comes back. Ooh. The future is now. I know. But see, the problem is, unless I move with it, the platform will leave me behind. And it makes staying on the platform much harder. Great. So in order to fix that, in order to make it so that the player does not just completely slide right off of it, we can add a little bit more to our script. So, yeah, we can, we can add a little, a, 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 some more code, some more. Okay. So I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit. So we can add, yeah, okay. So what we can do is, this is the way that I had it. There's a lot of ways to do this. But what I did was I made another vector called axis, which is the axis that it travels along. So I could determine uh, how far the player was going. There's other ways to do this. I suppose you could subtract position one from position two or whichever way, but I just made it public. So then you can make a, another bool for is it touching so that if the player is touching the platform, it's updating its position correctly. Then 
we also want to get the player object. We can, we're basically just update, we wanna be updating the transform of the player so that it moves along with the platform correctly. So we can get that and then we can finally get, this is something that's kind of important. Not so much for now, but might be for later. We want to be able to set if it should affect the player. For instance, if there's moving blocks that are supposed to push you off, when you touch them, when you make contact with them, you wouldn't want the player to suddenly be moving along with them because you only want this to apply to moving platforms that you'd want to stand on. So adding this bool makes basically no extra work, but makes it so you at least have the option of, of choosing. So we need to uh, set the initial values for some of these. For instance, touching is false. We can set the player object to game object dot find player. We did this in the low gravity. We did the same idea. And then finally, the axis we can normalize. What normalizing is, is we can take a vector and we can set it so that its total distance is one. This is important because if our platform isn't moving in one direction only, if it's moving, for instance, in the X and the Y, so it goes up and diagonally, we wouldn't want the, we wouldn't want to have to calculate the value to put into axis so that it updates at the same speed. This just does it for us, so it's a little bit easier to deal with. So, after we have those, now we can add another if statement to the two stages. So, we can say if touching, which was our bool to see if the player was touching, is equal to true and affect player is equal to true. Why did I, I miss that? So this way, if you are touching the platform and you want the player to be affected, we can then update the player. So then we can add player object dot transform dot position plus equals our axis, which is the s distance of one vector that controls which direction the platform's moving, times our step, which was how much the platform moves per, uh, per second, and then times delta dot, or time dot delta time, which normalizes it to be per second instead of per frame. So this, if we set the axis to one, for instance, in the X, because right now it's moving along the X, it should update the player with the exact same distance as the platform. So once they make contact with the platform, both of them will move alongside each other so the player won't slip off and be left behind. They'll go with it correctly. So the other thing we want to do is copy this and paste it into the other stage this time with negative axis, so it moves the opposite direction while we look at that. And then, so right now we have it working so that as long as the player's touching, we're good, we're good to go. But we need to actually determine if the player's touching. Now, we could do trigger enter with player just the same as before, but I'm actually going to say let's do something different so that we get an idea of something different. So let's do on collision enter. So the difference is collisions, so triggers are only when something enters a trigger box collider, but a collision is a regular collider, so something that has physics on it and will hit things. When that hits something else, that's when it's called. So this would be helpful if you didn't want to deal with triggers. So at the beginning, when we were determining whether to jump, we could have done this. I did triggers instead, but you could have done collisions instead. 
So the only difference here is instead of a collider, we use a collision. Otherwise, it pretty much works the same. So we can say if other dot name, sorry, that game object dot name dot equals player, just to make sure, hey, is this the player? And we can say touching is equal to true. We can then copy this. Okay, all right, thanks, formatting. Am I? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. There we go. Yeah, I know. I know because I copied the wrong one. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. All right. It's fine. <laughs> Too bad. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so uh, we can make this exit and we can set this to false. So the touching is now false. So assuming this works correctly, it should move the player at the same speed as the platform. So what we can do is we can go here, select our platform, and we can see our new stuff. So we do want it to affect the player. And we can set the axis to 1 on x and 0 on y and 0 on z. That way it will move. It's, it's saying that it will be moving positive x from position 1 to position 2. So assuming that this just works, when we go to said platform, once it comes back, come on. When we touch it, it updates our position along with the platform, so we are now going at the same speed. Now if we leave, we sort of lose that, but while we're on it, we can stay with it completely fine. So it won't boot us off and kill us. So this is, with a game like this, where it's more slippy, slidey physics, that might not be as important, but for a game where you're, for instance, an animated player running around. You wouldn't want to be sliding off of platforms as they move. You'd want to be standing on them correctly. So that's basically all I had for this. I'm going to keep on adding some more. I'm going to make it a little bit longer of a level. So if you guys want to experiment with this further with what we have and try and come up with something, you can. Otherwise, that was basically it of adding some new obstacles to a platformer and continuing to update it. So we did low gravity and moving platforms, which was pretty neat.